my name is Mark Kamau, and I'm a designer from Nairobi. And today I want to take you on a journey to show you my passion for design, and hopefully by the end, I can help you to join me. The next three billion people, the users of the internet, will come from frontier markets. Now, who do you think will connect them? How many of you think Facebook or Google? Well, the company I work for is called Brick. It's a Kenyan company, and it's our mission to connect people to the internet. And I believe we'll connect these three billion people to the internet. Now, like he said, I believe that design is the most powerful tool to transform Africa, and I'm very, very passionate about African design. But some people think I'm an I'm, I'm Afro hippie, but it's true. So I, I, was, I wasn't always a designer. I actually wanted to play for Manchester United. <laughs> you see, when I was growing up, my uncle, I grew up, I grew up in this neighborhood, and my uncle was the neighborhood goalkeeper. And when we would play other teams from other hoods, when they would win, that collective sense of purpose and pride for the community really inspired me. And I started playing football. And uh, this is me, captaining the Kenyan team for the Norway Cup, it's the big, largest youth soccer tournament in the world. And before he left, the president of Kenya gave me a flag saying, hey, you're the ambassador now. And I was like, wow, this is a big deal. I'm, going to, I'm really going to play for Manchester United. But then, the dirty little secret is paying players for playing football in some federations in Africa is a suggestion. It's not, uh, you know, money comes in, you're supposed to be paid. And I believe at some point, actually, while I was playing, I got to the national team level. And after three weeks of residential training, I didn't get any money. So I had to walk home as a national team goalkeeper. And I decided to quit. And then I joined this program. These three Dutch young ladies came to Kenya trying to, say, trying to teach young people from African neighborhoods to use computers. And the idea was to run an experiment to see if we teach these young people how to use computers, how would their narrative about their lives change from the Western media that talks about Africa to the West? But they opened a can of worms. That's where my design journey started, because I realized I was good with computers, and I was doing very well, but still, I needed to validate my skills. And so I found myself in a design firm in Berlin, doing cutting-edge work, working with cutting-edge brands. And at the time, one of the clients was Hugo Boss. And while I'd studied multimedia design, here I was interact we, we were designing experiences for human beings who get into a Hugo Boss shop. You see, when you get into a Hugo Boss shop in Milan or London or Paris, the experience is curated not just about the garments, but your behavior. And I was fascinated by this. But then, at Brick, we have this expression. It's called scratching at fleas. So when you're solving problems that don't fundamentally affect human life, you're scratching at fleas. So here I was in Berlin, scratching at fleas, while back home people were grappling with lion-sized problems. Yeah? And so while I was making a good living doing that, I was, my, my passion for Africa was calling. And so I didn't want to continue scratching at fleas. So back home, there's this organization called the IHUB that was doing amazing things. Young people were coming together, building technology that was solving problems for Africa. And there was a problem, though. You had these techies sitting in this space trying to design technology for people they didn't interact with. And so these technologies were not taking off. And these skills I was learning about how to design for human behavior, I thought could come in handy. So I talked to Eric Hasman about it, and he allowed me to start a human-centered design lab within the IHUB. Now, before I started this lab, I was talking to people in Kenya about human-centered design or user experience design, and they're like, what are you talking about? What is that? But then it started catching on, and we started helping hundreds of startups with their solutions. And this work got quite a bit of attention from the West. And all of a sudden, we were getting consultancies from the Googles of this world uh, and, and big companies from the West to go and who were trying to come into the emerging market. So 
I found myself spending time in Nigeria and other African countries, trying to help them understand these markets. But then, this practice after three years came to a head, because my role in this process was to really understand these complex markets and then go give these insights to these companies. But then, the problem was I got my check, but I never made something with it. And that bothered me quite a bit. And, it, and when it came to a head is when it involved my own mother. That's my own mother. And she had a cardiovascular condition. And at some point, uh, they were thinking about the new Millennium Development Goals, which involved reducing cardiovascular diseases by 25%. And so this London pharmaceutical company hired me to study the behavior of Africans in adhering to lifelong diseases like cardiovascular diseases. So for the longest time, I was studying my mother along with other people. And then when I finished the study, I flew to London to, give my, to, to deliver my insights. And then I, I asked myself, but what am I going to tell my mother? What, I, what am I going to make for her? What am I going to make for these people? And sometimes that's the problem with... Um, this kind of consulting, because you don't make anything sometimes. You don't know where that information goes. And so I decided, you know, I started this to solve problems for Africa, but here I am carrying the water for big companies, and I want to change that. And at that time, I was also consulting one, uh, through the UX lab for this company. How, how many of you have heard of Brick? Oh, that's a fair few of you. And so it was a small backup for the internet. And the way we design it is so that it can work anywhere. And so we decided to go on a trip from Nairobi, an expedition from Nairobi to Johannesburg, testing it in villages and schools to really see if it actually works. And, and so, yeah, we, we, we drove from Nairobi across nine countries, testing it in schools and with villages and villagers. And then when we learned a lot through, during, that, during that process. The purpose for which we had built the, the retail brick was one purpose, but we needed to think bigger. We needed to connect more people. We needed to solve for much bigger problems, and we needed to imagine Africa at a bigger context. For example, and, and, and you know, you, you always have to learn. Africans say you really have to learn from the advice you get, because when you interact with people, you actually end up learning about their situations, their pain points, their constraints, and their aspirations. So one of the problems we saw was education. This is one example of an African classroom. And then that's the other. So you have kids who have to walk to come here. And when they get there, they hardly have any infrastructure. So there's a huge imbalance in access to education. And, and what makes it worse is this kid who sits in this class is expected to sit the same exam with this kid. And so we decided to do something about that. We wanted to level the education playing field. But then we have a philosophy to design with and not for. And so we spent a lot of time, and it's not just me, the CEO, the creative director, the whole leadership and the team, really to try and understand education for Africa and how people, pupils and teachers interact and how education is delivered. And so I spent a lot of time studying, interacting, observing, and living amongst people. So we would camp in the school, in, in the school ground, for instance, for five days at a time. And we were not the first people who tried to deploy education for Africa. It has been tried. But then the, 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 the education and the hardware is not fit for purpose. Tablets break because if there's dust, there's, there's a lot of heat, and so on. And then charging is another problem. So you have the hardware problem, and then we learned about the charging problem. You see, there's this assumption that there's charging ports on African classrooms, but that's not true. Yeah? So a lot of these deployments become problematic. And then how do you update content? And so we decided to take this lion-sized problem and do something about it. 
So we took a pelican case. It's been tried in war. It's rugged, like it's rugged and it's Africa proof. And this At is what Brink, we mean. We truly understand the challenges of digital education in Africa. Just having devices of getting connectivity won't solve the education gap. We have to look at the bigger picture of delivering a sustainable platform for education. So we took what we had learned from working with Kenyan schools. We took the rugged products that we had been building at Brick and we put them together into the first fully integrated education platform designed in Africa for Africa. We introduced the Kio Kit. The Kio Kit combines the connectivity of the Brick, the server and content capacity of the Brick Buy and 40 over Africanized Kio tablets into a simple integrated platform that instantly turns any school room into a digital classroom. The entire solution fits into a secure, rugged and weather resistant case. To keep the setup simple, the Kio Kit only has one cable, its power cord. Because the classroom experience is so important to us, we designed the entire platform to be turned on and off from a single button. The Kio Kit revolutionizes the very idea of having technology in the African classroom. We don't just think about these ideas in our Nairobi lab. We spend a lot of time in classrooms across Kenya, observing, experimenting, and getting valuable feedback from both the teachers and the students. One lesson we learned from our earlier design iterations is that the tablet charging connection is the greatest single point of failure for devices used by children. So we engineered the Kio not to require a cable for charging. The Kio kit includes the fast practical use of wireless charging for education tablets, where the student simply drops their Kio into the kit and it begins charging. Another thing we observed in the classrooms was the teacher's challenge in describing how to put on the headphones correctly. So we color coordinated the earpieces to make giving instructions even easier. A common issue faced by schools in Africa is power interruptions. Once charged, the cues on the entire kit can run through a typical eight-hour school day. In off-grid environments, you can even run the entire system using solar. The Kio kit stores all the educational content on it so that you don't need to be connected to the internet or power for it to work. This means a school child in Turkana can get the same access to learning as a child in Nairobi. Brick is committed to leveling the education playing field in Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, the, the, that, that was a small African company taking on a big challenge and trying to solve for Africa. And the way we validate that is I was sitting in Sweden in the summer last year to talk to one of our clients who had bought over 100 of these for schools in Tanzania. And I thought he was going to make another order for African countries and he said, he was trying to order them from, for German rural schools. So think about that. Technology built in Africa being exported to a German school. <laughs> now, like I said, over three billion people don't have access to the internet. And for me, the struggle with design and now Africa is looked at when you talk about design and solving problems for Africa, is startups are given small amounts of capital, and so they stay small. And we don't have space to think about the big problems in Africa. But then, this is my challenge today. We can dare think about how to disrupt and participate, even on the bigger problems about our continent, for disease, healthcare, education, and such. Now, we have taken on this challenge. We want to connect the next three billion people to the internet. But the problem is, the internet is not built for Africa. The way the infrastructure works, it assumes that there is a server somewhere in California, for example, and you request for information, and then it's gonna travel from the server from California all the way to your computer or your device. But then Africa and our context are different. We don't have the infrastructure. 
and you cannot make that assumption. And so, how do you solve for that? Is it possible for a small African company to disrupt how internet works? Could we disrupt how servers store information in Africa and how connectivity is dis distributed? Yes, we can. I introduce to you the brick. This is a ruggedized microserver so that the amount of information you have to consume if you're in a village in Rwanda or a village in Kenya or a township in Cape Town, you don't need to have information travel all the way from California to you, but it can travel from a super brick that's standing right next to you on a tree, on a power pole, whatever you put it, because it's weatherproof, it has computational capacity and storage capacity. And this is, for example, a deployment of, the, of brick in, in, in a school in Rwanda. We've deployed this in different schools in Rwanda and different villages in Rwanda. And in Kenya, for example, if you go into a taxi, what you call a taxi and we call a matatu, you'll see this sign. And that means you can have internet as long as you want for free. So we've installed this in many, many, many hundreds of buses and barber shops and solar kiosks and in villages. And we're transforming how people access, to the, access the internet. Because the problem often is access and cost. And we've, and we've removed that problem with this solution. Now, all of a sudden, even the big boys, we can take... Yeah, and we're working, we're working even with big partners now to, to, to deploy these solutions. And all of a sudden, an African who could not access information can now access information regardless of whether there's infrastructure around them. And so we are going to deploy and deploy and deploy until all three billion people are connected. Now, I strongly believe that gone are the days when solutions parachute from the West to Africa. The stakes are simply too high to do these experiments. It's time for Africa and African designers and companies to take this stage. And I hope the examples I demonstrate to you give you some courage and impetus and at least inspire you to go out there and solve lion-sized challenges for Africa. Thank you.